Hello, you're watching ClearBridge Investments exclusive 2021 Outlook Masterclass. We'll cover what the new administration could mean for markets, the rally in growth stocks, and where to find opportunities in the new year. Joining us now are three portfolio managers from ClearBridge Investments. Margaret Vitrano, who focuses on large cap growth, Michael Testorf, who focuses on international and global growth, and Mike Klarfeld, who focuses on dividend strategies. Everyone, thank you for joining us. Let's start with the U.S. election, which is finally in the rearview mirror with a Biden White House likely working with a divided Congress. Given this outcome, Margaret, what do you see as the most notable impact on growth stocks? Yeah, well, you know, I think for for growth stocks, one of the um, one of the areas that had been talked about a lot during the election for potential change was tax reform, and I think with a divided Washington, um, the chances for broad tax reform are probably lower. And so, what that means is, you know, higher capital gains tax rates, higher corporate tax rates, higher tax national income. All of those are probably a little bit less likely um, for technology companies, many of which are multinational companies that have a big portion of their revenue coming from offshore. That means that their tax rates are probably not going up. The other area that, um, that I think is talked about a lot as it relates to big growth companies is regulation. Um, and I, on that front, I would say that a divided Congress probably doesn't, or a divided Congress and a divided Washington probably doesn't make that much of a difference because um, because regulation of the biggest technology companies is really a bipartisan issue. Um, it's it's been an area that's been under a lot of scrutiny um, under the, the the prior administration, and I would anticipate is probably a concern over the next couple of years as well. So no no real change there. Mike, what about dividend paying equities? Yeah, so um, I, I think I'd broadly probably echo what, what Margaret said, which is that um, there are some modest uh, changes in, in the change in administration and the, and the new Congress, but, but we actually don't see big changes. I think from an investor and market perspective, um, what would have been most meaningful in terms of, of leading to a real change in the markets would have been if you had a significant blue wave. So you had a unified president with uh, you know Congress behind him with a a strong majority that could have passed through a, a lot of legislation. Uh, uh, and th that would have had a whole host of implications and we'd be having a different conversation now. But I think with the outcome that we have, um, we don't see uh, uh, many significant changes. I'd also talk about the tax point. One of the concerns we would have had would have been that um, in terms of how dividends are taxed and capital gains are taxed, um, for a long time up until 2003, dividends were taxed uh, at the same rate as ordinary income. In 2003, uh, tax laws were changed such that dividends became favorably tax direction, tax equivalent to long-term capital gains. And that really drove a renaissance in dividend investing. So we had been watching, uh, that would have been a concern if, if the dividend taxes were changed, but they weren't. So again, long-winded way of saying that um, there, there were scenarios where there could have been a lot of changes out of Washington, but, but broadly speaking, we don't see many. And Michael, how does a new US president influence trade tensions and other geopolitical risks that you follow? Yes, I think international market take it as a big relief. Um, uh, Biden is seen as a more consistent and rational with his international policies. And I think there would be a lot of parallels with the Obama administration, where foreign policies are concerned. And step number one will be repairing the damage with the U.S. allies. And I mean, Europe and Japan in particular, which helps trade uh, with both regions. And in terms of Russia, I think that Biden will be expected to be tougher than Trump, uh, but Russia is less of an importance for overall equity markets. And uh, the other part which will make a difference internationally could be human rights, uh, where Biden is clearly uh, uh, pushing for that. And most pronounced will that be in some of the emerging markets where we, see, where we have dictatorships. And most important is actually to see what it means for China. China is number two economy in the world uh, and getting more important year by year. Um, but what is important to see, the Chinese are very pragmatic, uh, the way how they deal with policies. They are also very interested to de-escalate the situation with the United States. They're long-term minded politicians. They want to be at one point independent from the West as much as possible. And de-escalation would buy them time. But Biden will not be dovish. I, I, I don't see that. And uh, but he will look through it and he will pick his fights case by case, case by case, and he will consult with the business leaders 
and see what hurts, what, what would work. And so I, I mean, to sum it up, China, US, I think there will be an improvement, but only a little improvement. I think where we see a big change is in terms of climate change, as you mentioned already before, because the US will align with the international players. They will rejoin the Paris Accord. Um, although, as uh, Mike and uh, uh, Margaret, you said, there will be, it was not a blue wave, and therefore he will not have all the funds available, which he had before. But I think there will be enough playroom for him to make a change in terms of climate change. And we'll certainly talk more about ESG and the environment later in the program. But before we get there, let's spend a little bit of time on growth and tech stocks. Michael, U.S. growth stocks have seen a big lift since the pandemic, while the rest of the U.S. market, as well as international shares, have lagged. How does recent performance set up global markets heading into 2021? So, yes, uh, it appears that international markets have not done well, in particular not compared to the S&P 500. And I think there's a, a good part of that is the composition of the respective indices. And if you look at S&P 500, it has 27% in tech, which was, of course, a major winner in the pandemic, and only 10% of financials, which were a clear loser. So if you look at the international side, so MSCI EFA, which is everything outside of, outside of the U.S., um, uh, there we have only 8% in tech and 16% in financials. And if you look at the tech part of international markets, that did also relatively well. And secondly, the, the countries which have done or which have been in the corona lockdown earlier and came out earlier, therefore, have done also relatively well. So China was up uh, the local market 27% and the tech heavy Shenzhen market was around 39%. But you're right, in general, the international markets, in particular Europe, Japan, and most emerging markets are more cyclical in nature and have lacked S&P 500, and that's where the opportunity is. But so first of all, if, if you believe like I do, that vaccines are successfully rolled out, the economy should recover nicely in 21 and 22. Markets have perhaps taken some of that already in account, but I think there's more to go and inter international markets should do relatively well as they are more exposed to the cyclical upswing of the economy. So secondly, um, I do think that there is quite some money still sitting on the sideline and they're looking for an opportunity to get involved. And there are not that many liquid asset classes which are available and, and earning you a decent return besides equities. That means people will likely buy the dips Asia and Japan have seen inflows already, but Europe and the rest of emerging markets have not. And compared to the heydays of international investing, which is quite some years ago, I have to say, we are still far away from the highs. So I see interest rates being low um, because central banks have uh, learned their lessons from the financial crisis, and which means taking, taking uh, away the foot from the gas pedal too early can hurt economies more than than expected. So lose money, lose money policy will continue, um, and that is definitely positive for equity markets. And even Japan, which was a market which has been out of favor for ages, is undergoing some secular changes. Japan has a new prime minister, which will lead these changes. But even more important is a change in companies thinking about being more profitable which is good for valuations and good for share prices. And then the icing on the cake could be currency gains. And with a cyclical upswing in the international markets, normally comes a dollar weakness. And we have seen that in the early to mid 2000s, um, which is now supported by an interest rate differential between US dollar and most international currencies, which has narrowed somewhat. Um, so U.S. dollar weakness could help uh, the international markets uh, as well. So the big picture is not that bad for international. The tides could be turning for international markets. I hope so. <laughs> OK, I'm talking my book here, right? But uh, but uh, I think the, the setup is pretty good. Well, but to that point, it's interesting because the so much of what you think about the U.S. stock market, it's really tech. Right, especially as a growth as a growth investor for the Russell 1000 Growth Index, we're 50 to 55 percent tech. So of course we 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 look brilliant this year because the tech markets have been so strong. If if tech were only 10 percent of our index, you know our appreciation this year would be vastly different and and much more like some of the other markets globally. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Margaret. And it's also worth pointing out that technology and internet stocks have led the market for the last several years, not just in 2020, although the advantage definitely grew more pronounced as work from home became the norm due to COVID-19. Mike, is valuation and market concentration a concern or do these areas still hold promise? I think the answer is is, is, is that uh, yes to both in the sense that um, absolutely these areas still hold promise. So, I mean, I think if we look at a lot of the largest U.S. Uh, growth companies and tech companies, it's not hyperbole to say that they're some of the best companies the world's ever seen. Um, they are phenomenally profitable. They have terrific returns on invested capital. They have big moats. And these are companies like whether it's Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Facebook are putting up really terrific growth rates, uh, even off huge bases, right? So it's, 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 they're pretty staggeringly wonderful companies. And from a fundamental perspective, if we set aside the regulatory risks, which are real uh, and hard to quantify, but also unknowable, aside from those, it's hard to see, um, you know, how you really would have a, a meaningful diminution in, in, uh, in their relevance and, and strength and growth. So, so they're terrific companies that absolutely merit the kind of enthusiasm that they have. At the same time, um, the valuations um, are, are full. They're not crazy. Uh, this isn't like 1999 at all, where things were valued based on eyeballs or your Super Bowl ad. Uh, these are the most profitable companies in the world. But it's also true to say that um, if interest rates were to ever change meaningfully, that would have uh, big ramifications for all asset classes. And growth stocks, um, I wouldn't say necessarily more than more than others. Uh, they would be in a category though with some others because they're very long duration investments where the value is based a lot on the growth in the future. And so to the extent that uh, interest rates, if they ever move, it, it could present a real risk. I think echoing something Margaret said earlier, there is also a concentration consideration um, where these companies have become very large components of, of the markets. Um, and again, in one respect, that makes sense given their size and profitability. Uh, and at the other, um, you know, and you have certain sectors that have become like energy, for example, which has become effectively negligible in the S&P 500, even though it's obviously incredibly relevant to the global economy. And we'll talk about that more, I think, later. But, but so, you know, it's a mixed bag and is the answer that uh, these companies um, continue to have very attractive prospects and, and merit much of the valuations they have. And yet there are concerns around concentration and valuations, particularly if interest rates ever change. Yeah, Margaret, I see you nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's it's very pronounced within growth that that spread of the hyper growth companies, many of which are up 75 percent or so this year. I mean, just just momentum companies overall um, within the Russell 1000 growth index are up 30 percent. But the value part of my index is down 47 percent. That spread is enormous. Um, so what you're seeing is that that small segment of companies that are really benefiting from work from home um, have, have pulled forward several years of growth and they're trading at very high valuation. So the question is, where do you go from here? And just getting back to something Michael said before, you know, I do think that as we move through the recovery whenever that happens. Um, but on the other side of, of the pandemic, we are going to see more of a broadening out of the market. Um, that, that, that group that's down 47% is going to start to recover. You'll see a kind of a broadening out of participation. So, you know, I, I think that when I think about technology, I think that the, the work from home trend has certainly pulled forward a lot of demand. That demand, we're still very um, nascent in terms of cloud computing, in terms of shift of consumption offline to online, cloud security, collaboration. There, there's a decade of growth still to come. Um, it may not be linear from here. Um, so, you know, I just think we have to be careful that that there is still a long runway for growth, but um, but we've pulled forward a lot of it into 2020 as a result of this just exogenous event. So some of these trends could be here to stay, even if life does start to return to normal. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think it's interesting because one of the one of the areas that you see a lot of growth in is cloud security, and and that's because we're doing so much more of value online. It, you know, we've been watching videos online for a while, but now that we're transacting all of our finances online, or now that we're having business meetings online, now that we're putting um, payroll and human resources records online. 
that that needs a whole different level of security. So things like that, and, and by the way, the attacks are getting more sophisticated. So things like that are, are important and, and will be increasingly important for decades to come. Collaboration, now that we can all work in different places and still communicate, we need, we need more and more tools to help us do this effectively. Um, so I think all of those have, have a lot of runway for growth. It's just a matter of what you pay for it. <laughs> so it's trying to balance the long-term growth with where you think you can find value in, in the stock market. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps I chime in on that one as well. So, I mean, COVID-19, as you said, Margaret, I mean, has accelerated the adoption of, of technology, online penetration and digitization. I mean, in 2020, growth rates are fully, fully agreed that cannot be extrapolated into the next years because of the rollout in 2021 of the vaccine, which I'm a believer in, as I said, there will be some reversal. I mean, there will be a rotation happening because of the dis discrepancy, which you just described between growth and value. But there are, there are certain things and which we have learned during the pandemic um, and we behave differently and some of them will be sticky. And you, you mentioned one and uh, I press add one, which is the payment space, right? So you were, I mean, you use digital payment, which is a credit card or any kind of other mean for internet shopping already a long time, right? But didn't you actually like to use Apple Pay, Google Pay, or just tapping your credit card on the terminal when you were grocery shopping and forget about these kind of dirty, filthy notes and coins? And, and uh, I think this will be one which will be definitely sticky. And if you see what other countries, where they are already in terms of penetration. So if you look at South Korea and China, we're already at 80, north of 80 percent. Tech savvy country like Sweden, 80 percent. The United States is around 32 percent where the world average is. And my whatever country, my birth country is Germany. I feel very bad about it, but they have only 20 percent. If you go further south to Italy, Spain, Greece, they love their cash. It's 15 percent. So there's a long way to go to the 60 to 80 percent. And and you mentioned working from home. I think the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, what what was looked at was suspicion, you know, because people might not work from home and so on. This is, I think this is done, this argument. And and we have shown with a lot of success that we can do it. In, you know, also this kind here remotely, we have a, we have a asset TV, which is phenomenal. So, um, and when it comes to food and grocery uh, shopping, I mean, we have been, uh, become a professional, how to order, um, how do we get it delivered, and so on. So I think this convenience factor will continue, probably not as grossy as it was before, but it will continue. And uh, to be very honest, in my lifetime, I have never seen so many disruption forces working at all at the same time. And I do believe that the cloud AI internet renewables ev is offering really good long-term growth stories and uh and we have to be careful uh, with some of the value sectors because they get disrupted and uh, they could face uh, kind of stranded assets which have to be written off and weigh on profits of companies so um i think there is a uh, quite some interesting stuff in the growth growth segment and I do believe there could be a rotation, but the question is, for how long will it last? Yeah, fascinating point there, too, about digital payments and some of these trends that were already underway. I love the book Curse of Cash by Ken Rogoff, and I know they talk a lot about India as well. Yes, I mean, India is definitely one of them. Um, and, and I think this is true for all the emerging markets. We have more exposure to Brazil on the payment space uh, because there the regulator is clearly in favor uh, of pushing for opening up the banking market and the banking banks in Brazil has has super high margins and which is not necessarily good for the consumer and the regulators on the side of the consumer and would like to open up monopolies and that's why why some of these payment companies have been so incredibly successful we have a company which is called stone which is uh, making further further progress coming from the small and medium-sized enterprises and going to the larger ones as well
Now, going back to the vaccine, and I know Margaret mentioned the recovery, with positive news on the COVID vaccine front, we've seen bond yields begin to rise and stocks rally. In fact, the S&P 500 and Dow both hit new record highs the same day the news broke that Moderna's vaccine was 95% effective. There's a lot of optimism, too, surrounding Pfizer's vaccine. Michael, are we discounting too rosy a scenario, or will we see a commercially available vaccine soon? And if so, can that act as a catalyst for healthcare stocks? So um, from my side, I mean, I'm a believer in the vaccines. Uh, I do see, of course, certain risks with this because um, the world is baking in already some normalization because of the vaccine. Now, the risks which are there is that potentially um, that, the, that the rollout will be too slow. Um, I think the developed markets have done a pretty good job already in terms of preparation. I think the risk is more on the on the countries which are a little bit poorer uh, because they a get the vaccine later, they do not have the infrastructure to deal with the extreme refrigeration uh, requirements, and that could slow down herd immunity globally. And I hope that WHO and and uh, the pharma industry and the developed nations will chip in a little bit to make sure that also the laggards, meaning the poorer countries, have a chance to get vaccinated. Now, the good news is that there are other vaccines in the make uh, which will not require these extreme conditions. So, and the other risk, of course, could be that there is a slow uptake of vaccines. So far around only 50% would like to be vaccinated. And for herd immunity, we need at least that uptake. And I, I personally, as I, as, as I said before, I'm a more positive thinking about these vaccines and I will like to be vaccinated earlier than later, I could see that people will, or this number of 50% will increase over the next months as we unfortunately will see more cases uh, in the Northern Hemisphere and, um, and therefore some people might see the benefits of vaccinations. I, I also think that in, in a low interest rate environment, the market is just very simplistically kind of looking through how we roll out the vaccine and how long it takes. Because in a zero rate environment, the market's kind of looking at 2022 and 2023 for valuation. So, you know, very simplistically, it doesn't matter whether it's six months earlier or later than what you and I might guess. Um, and I think that 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 gets back to what the market is discounting. Low interest rate environment and all the stimulus we've seen has really enabled the market to kind of look through how long it takes and which countries go first, but look through to the recovery and value stocks on, on that recover, those recovered earnings. The other thing is, you know, it's interesting because in um, as, as, as a large growth investor, healthcare has really just had a target on its back for, I don't know, five years. Um, and I do think that while it's it, drug pricing is still going to be a topic in Washington, I'm sure. But I think that if there's one thing that we've seen um, out of the pandemic, it is that it, it's important for our country globally to have a vibrant healthcare ecosystem, to have drug delivery, to have drug R&D, to have an infrastructure in order to, to facilitate testing and care. And my, my hope is that all of that um, will, will maybe mean that, you know, governments around the world will, will allow healthcare companies to, to enable, to, to be profitable enough to invest in their business and continue to grow. So my hope is that um, that some of the negativity around healthcare companies in that sector in general will abate a little bit on the other side of this. Mike, what do you make evaluations on the heels of the vaccine news? Yeah, so I, I think um, kind of echoing what Margaret and Michael have said, I mean, uh, the vaccine news was as, as, as good as it could be, I think. Um, you know, the, the, the reality that we have a vaccine, two vaccines that are 95% effective, which is, you know, comparable, uh, you know, all of us has turned into armchair epidemiologists, but, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert here, but it is, is as effective or more effective than all the childhood vaccines we get. So, um, you know, this is an incredibly uh, effective vaccine. And I think it provides a definitive marker that there will be an end to, to the pandemic. And I think the world is currently operating on two timeframes um, the short to intermediate term is that it's going to be a very brutal winter uh, in the Northern Hemisphere and the, the human suffering is going to be awful and we're all going to have to, you know, uh, continue to social distance and not have a lot of fun. Um, um, but, but it, you know, the market mostly appropriately is looking through three or four months and realizing that in April or May, 
uh, you know, it's going to be a, a very powerful recovery. I think it, it sets up, I think Michael Testorff's points about the global rollout are correct. There will definitely be differences in how it gets rolled out in emerging markets versus developed markets. And that's unfortunate, absolutely. Um, but there also will be a globally synchronized recovery that has a, a, a lot of uh, potential, um, you know, momentum and power behind it. So from a valuation perspective, I come back to what I, what I, I think I said earlier in, in, the, in the conversation, which is um, uh, from a fundamental perspective, I think the enthusiasm about the vaccine is absolutely right. The key question rem remains, uh, does this do anything to interest rates? And so far, the answer has been no. Um, but, you know, we've been in this um, sort of absurdly low interest rate environment. We don't even talk about the fact that interest rates are negative in most of the world these days. We just accept it. But we've been in this absurdly low interest rate environment for a decade, um, which has underpinned all sorts of things in markets uh, across the world. And, uh, it, it, as long as that doesn't change, I, th I think the current uh, the valuations all make sense. The, the question is, do, does the vaccine somehow catalyze a global uh, economic recovery that it leads to a change in the yield curve and rising rates, in which case the valuations would, would, would uh, prove challenging. So uh, looking forward to when we can gather in big groups again, go to concerts, have lots of fun, uh, have a babysitter, as uh, I know you're looking forward to. Uh, what impact will this move toward normalcy have on both U.S. and international equity markets? Mike? Yeah, I think uh, it's going to have a, a tremendous impact. Um, and, and I'm glad you framed the question in terms of comparing the U.S. and global markets, because I think that's something the U.S. investors need to do right now. Uh, I think we're very lucky in the United States that um, our economy and our markets are so big and diversified that they provide really sort of, you know, most U.S. investors probably are mostly focused on U.S. investments, which which uh, works because we have exposure to all these different sectors. We're lucky like that. Uh, if you lived in different areas, for example, you know, um, for example, my wife is Canadian. So, you know, if you're a Canadian, uh, you have huge potential investments in, in the Canadian markets in resources and banks and stuff like that, but not a lot in some other areas, like nothing like the technology uh, investment potentially you have in the United States. So as U.S. investors, we tend to be U.S. focused. The U.S. markets have outperformed global markets, and my colleague Michael talked about this uh, more knowledgeably than I have, but have, have outperformed markets um, uh, tremendously over a very long period of time. And we saw that uh, pick up even more momentum this year as the work from home trades uh, took effect and the technology companies um, many of which happen to be U U.S. based, um, saw their fundamental performance improve and their valuations and stock take off. So I, I think there's a real potential that you have a global rotation uh, in, the, in the year ahead as the vaccine normalizes economic activity around the world, as people um, pull out some of the monies they put into these work from home winners where they've been sort of hiding out, not just hiding out, but hiding out in, 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 a, in what is perceived as a safer area and start to reposition. So I think Within the United States, the, the potential is you, is similar. It, it's that sort of microcosm of, uh, I think you'll have a big sector rotation or potentially meaningful sector rotation as, um, as people come out of certain areas and into others. And I think that's a microcosm of what you're going to see on a global basis and is something that U.S. investors need to be mindful of. Right. On the international side, I think that would be a two-tier two -tier market because there have been economies uh, which are in the pandemic earlier and successfully contained the pandemic. So, and they will be, of course, back to normal earlier. And they actually have been. So if you look at China, for example, I mean, China overall had, I mean, it's, it's, it's mind boggling, has less than 5,000 deaths. South Korea was a little bit more than 500. And Taiwan is below 10. I mean, it's like, you cannot even believe it that this happened when you see all these numbers in the Western world. And if you look at these countries in particular, the manufacturing output is already back where it was and actually growing. So the only, the only one which is not necessarily back where it has been is the service sector. And, and I think these countries on a relatively scale, I'm talking about Asia or Northern Asia, China, North, Taiwan, North Korea, they will have less upside potential because of this rotation versus the ones which were really hit hard. And uh, these are the ones which particular are located in the southern part of Europe, which is like Italy and Greece and, and, and Spain and potentially France, because they didn't have the tourism. But also many of the emerging markets. Uh, so I'm, I'm just highlighting the big ones like Brazil and India, which should be doing relatively well in this kind of normalization trade. So I asked the question a little bit earlier. So how long does this kind of rotation actually last? And so 
we have looked into 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 the past and these rotation trades are normally somewhere between two and five months and with an average of three. And if I look at it, I think we are we have done already whatever a third or half, if I should guess, done with the rotation which we have seen. And and I'm asking myself, what are the, actually the ingredients which have to go in to make this an outsized, very long uh, uh, rotation, where particularly the value part of the of the markets will do very well. So, and for me, the the critical part of that is what will happen actually to inflation, and inflation means then also a rise of long term or long term rates. And as I said before, I mean, the, the short term rates, I think they will stay low for quite some time. And if you look at market rates and uh, in the international markets, they look like flat, like a pancake. There is there's no upswing whatsoever. And then we have a little bit of a kind of up, uptick in, 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 in long term rates. And I think you might see a little bit more in the US than internationally. But I don't believe that it's a longer, longer phenomenon because uh, the central banks are still accommodative. Uh, I think there is still quite some slack in the economy. And we talked so much about technology, but technology will lead to efficiency gains and that will be in the long term will be deflationary. So, so I, I, I see there is an, also an end to, to a rotation trade. Uh, we don't know how violent it will be. But at the end of the day, I mean, there might be the pause or a decline in the winners because they are the source of, of money in this rotation trade. But we are on the international sides. We're, we're looking actually also glass half full, looking at the opportunity which it offers to, for us to increase our exposure to these kind of quality growth names. These are the ones with the strong management, the good cash flow generation, and uh, then hopefully developing a discount or bigger discount to their intrinsic value. So we're happy to pick up some of the great franchises on, on this weakness. Because I think that so many, there are so many of these, um, th there's been so much retail money that's flowed into the market. There are a lot of ETFs that have really driven up technology. Um, technology growth companies. And so, you know, once you see some kind of reversal, even if it's just a, a month long or three months long, um, you may get some entry, some good entry points. And that kind of dovetails nicely with what we were just talking about before, which is those secular long-term trends are still intact. So I think all of us are kind of trying to be valuation sensitive and, and pick points where we can still own things for the next five and 10 years, but hopefully buy them in a smart way. Turning to ESG, interest in sustainable investing continues to accelerate with ambitious economic recovery policies on the environmental and, to lesser extent, social front. Margaret, what types of opportunities can this create in 2021 for active equity strategies? Well, one of the themes that we really like is um, electric vehicles, not only um, because it's, it's, it fits well um, on an ESG basis with less use of, of, carb, of fossil fuels, um, but we, you're all, uh, the consumption of, of autos and purchasing of autos is also at a cyclical low. So um, global auto sales have been cyclically depressed for the last several years. Um, and so, you know, we think that there's a potential for cyclical uplift there. And there are also globally company uh, Globally, uh, governments are also um, providing incentives for automakers to produce more electric vehicles and for consumers <laughs> to buy more of these um, vehicles with less of a carbon footprint. So for, for several different reasons, we think that um, electric vehicles have that that's a great, um, not just a short cyclical trend, but one that we think is foots well with, with an ESG basis, um, but also has a nice cyclical component too. So we've been looking at a couple of companies in that space. I, I, agree, I agree, Margaret. I mean, uh, electric vehicle is also one of our favorite subjects to talk about without any doubt. But um, let's look at ESG because ESG in Europe has been already a, a big, big, big winner and a lot of money has uh, focused on ESG. Um, but there is in the U.S. We are just catching up uh, on on these kind of trend towards ESG focused funds, and that's where most of the active uh, money is actually going. And and I agree, random environmental changes will see the largest impact in the years to come now. And it's not only the the Biden administration here in the U.S. who is looking at at climate change in particular. 
Actually, there are so many countries in the world which have set already challenging targets. So earlier in the year that we had the EU talking about ambitious goals. By 2050, they want to be carbon free. 2030, they want to be reach at least 50% reduction. And the current goal was 40. Japan wants to be carbon free in 2050. And in September, even China talked about being carbon neutral by 2060. So China, as you, as you might know, I mean, is the biggest emitter of CO2 globally. We're talking about 28% of all CO2 comes out of China. So that's uh, what, is the, what is the recipe for healing? I think uh, it, it's the renewable part. And I think there will be a massive build out of wind onshore, offshore and solar projects. And if you want to put that a little bit in perspective, today 60% of the electricity production comes still from fossil fuel and only 10% from renewables. So, and the rest is from nuclear and hydro. And if you look at the forecast for 2050, there will be 60% coming from renewable and 30% from fossil. So that means the sector has to grow at least six, six times by 2050. And that would increase that we don't need more electricity. And if Margaret is so excited about electric vehicle as we are, then electric, I mean, electricity demands will even rise. And that will lead to this sector by growth rates between probably just shy of 10% per annum, which is huge for such a long period of time. And if I were doing even the exercise, looking at all the kind of pipeline of all these kind of renewable players, this is only a fraction of what has to happen to meet these long-term goals. And uh, therefore, so I do believe in the renewable space, there are a lot of investment opportunities. We have some, we have done, of course, quite some more because we are so convinced about it. We have uh, Vestas, which is uh, a Danish company, is the largest windmill producer uh, we have EDP, a Portuguese company, which is the largest wind developer in the world. And we have Solar Edge, uh, which is producing, I think, the best inverters and for solar systems. And the inverter is actually the brain of a solar installation. I'm a huge believer in renewables as well, broadly. But many of those companies are small. They're, they're, you know, it's just such a nascent space that hopefully in the next five years, many of these other renewable kinds of companies, whether it's hydrogen or wind or solar, will graduate up into my space. <laughs> yeah, that's the good thing. What we, what we have, we could, we are all cap, um, can do some mid-sized uh, companies as well. And, and you're right, there are many of them in the 10, 20, 30, 40 billion uh, uh, market cap. And Mike, I know you manage some dividend ESG strategies. So taking a closer look at the E, the S, and the G, what do you see as the most important issues in the year ahead? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think 2020 was a watershed year uh, for ESG investing in the United States. Um, as my colleague Michael has mentioned, uh, ESG has been um, a dominant theme in Europe for quite some time. The United States has been way behind. Uh, and I think a lot, there have been a lot of, I wouldn't say lip service, but but a lot of sort of, uh, rumblings about ESG, but we didn't really see either investors or corporate managements embracing it. I think in the last 18 to 24 months, we really saw it on the environmental side, and I'll come back to that in a second. And I think that in 2020, we also saw it on the social side. So obviously, over the summer with the killing of George Floyd and the blossoming of the Black Lives Movement, uh, I think it brought systemic racism in the United States to the, fore, to the forefront. And I think companies have stepped up uh, and realized that they need to do a better job and, and really work to be part of uh, a solution in that regard. And so there's obviously a long way to go, but we've seen companies actually address that in ways we haven't seen before. So I think from a social perspective, uh, that was a big change. From the environmental side, I'm probably gonna sound like a broken record with my colleagues, where um, we just think electrification is a massive deal. Um, it's, uh, it's really, you know, energy is at the core of, of the modern economy. And, um, and, and uh, the amount of investment that will be required as we move towards uh, less fossil fuels and more renewables is, is in the tens of trillions of dollars. Um, and this is not a one year or two year thing, this is a decades thing. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of the things people will talk about is, well, what's the importance of a Biden administration in this regard? And obviously a Biden administration is more supportive of it uh, than the Trump administration has been, but it's really beyond that now. Uh, climate change is far less of a partisan issue than it used to be. Uh, it is more broadly uh, embraced by Democrats and Republicans across the country. Uh, and it's not just the federal level, it's at the state level. So many states in the United States have embraced uh, very aggressive renewable portfolio standards, which are driving investment. 
from our perspective in, in dividend investing, one of the best ways that, that we believe you can play this, sec, this uh, theme is through electric utilities. Uh, and utilities are something that, um, you know, they're not always the sexiest companies. And many times in the last 20 years, I've looked at them and we've looked at them and thought that they didn't have attractive uh, investment opportunities. This year, however, we think they do. Uh, because of um, the way the stock markets play out this year where growth companies have done so well, uh, you have an interesting phenomenon where during the pandemic, utilities, which fundamentally did exactly what they should, which is deliver stable, steady earnings like, like they expected at the beginning of the year, they've actually underperformed. Uh, and so it set up a situation where you have an attractive entry valuation, an attractive current dividend yield, and we think really pretty nice uh, dividend growth for as far as the eye can see. Now, it's not it's not the kind of dividend growth or income growth you might see with some of Margaret stocks that are growing 20, 30, 40 percent a year. But we think that um, dividend that uh, electric utilities can grow their dividends in the high single digits as far as the eye can see, which when you combine that with a three to four percent upfront yield and a very low risk business model. Uh, we think that sets up for a very attractive uh, investment opportunity. And Michael, going back to what you said about Europe and other parts of the world, getting a head start on ESG compared to the U.S., where do you think ESG is most advanced? And building on your comments earlier, what does the future of ESG look like on a global scale? So let's let's start, start with the second part of your question. I mean, the ESG side will be very, very, very powerful. And uh, I mean, as I said before, there is so much money right now in Europe, active money going into ESG, and I do expect it will happen. The same thing will happen globally. So uh, there will be therefore also focus of all asset managers. And fortunately, we're at Clearbridge um, where we have a long history of ESG investing already. But asset managers which will not embrace the ESG principles will have long term, I think, will have a problem or less inflows in terms of money. And on the other hand, I see, I look at the companies, right? Um, the companies which are not embracing ESG will have a problem too, because the force of investors and um, investors, shareholders, and potentially governments uh, to look at, not only at uh, whatever the climate change aspect, but it's also the supply chain. It's about governance and so on and so on, uh, that it's very, very important for companies to think about it, how the ESG will look like uh, in the short to medium term. Countries which have done already a very good job in that uh, are the northern part of Europe, without uh, any doubt. Um, and uh, I have seen some of that also in Australia. And then there are other parts which are clearly behind. And um, uh, so, I mean, uh, I, I wish that we are getting all on, on, on higher levels going forward. And I think the pressure is high and therefore I'm also half full glass thinker on ESG here. I would also uh, just chime in. Um, uh, this isn't just happening with in investors and shareholders. You're seeing this more broadly in, in financial services and the financial system. So interestingly, uh, just this morning, I, I noticed that um, a Bank of America came out and said that they will not finance drilling um, in, in the Arctic, which uh, I think the, the, the outgoing administration is, is offering some drilling permits there um, that, that had been held back for a long time now being offered. And, and so Bank of America, one of the largest banks, obviously, in the country in the world, is saying we won't finance it. And um, I, I think there are others like that as well. So it's not just a shareholder thing where you're seeing this. You're also seeing uh, banks, you know, which finance their clients saying, uh, you know, there are certain parts of oil and gas, of course, we're going to continue to participate in. But there are certain areas that we're saying we're drawing a line and in, in, in saying that, that uh, it's not right in the long term interest of the world, but we take the totality of profits and social interests and, and, and society. Yeah. And Mike, spending a little bit more time on your 2021 outlook here, it's no surprise that many sectors have struggled due to restrictions on activity like travel, eating out and shopping and stores. Energy demand has also fallen sharply. Which areas do you think are best positioned for a comeback in the year ahead? Yeah, so um, I, I think fundamentally there are many areas uh, that are ripe for a comeback. And when I say fundamentals, I mean, I think, uh, you know, restaurants which have uh, or theme parks, which are, you know, theme parks are entirely shut in many cases. Uh, you're going to see a huge resurgence uh, in people who are, you know, have been dying to take their kids to Disneyland and finally can. And you're going to see business really, um, uh, you know, skyrocket and recover. I think in many of those situations, though, not all, but much of that has been priced in. The area that we continue to believe is, some, is potentially the most interesting is energy um, in the sense that, um, 
you know, this is a cyclical business for sure. Um, and what we saw in 2020 was a drop off where um, this never happened before. Oil demand globally fell by, you know, meaningfully into the double digits. And uh, oil is a, um, you know, these are depleting resources. Uh, each year production declines based because the existing asset base is not as robust as the year before. And if you don't invest, ultimately that's going to have ramifications. And so even while we uh, believe that, you know, longer term, we hope that fossil fuels go away for, you know, to mitigate climate change, for better or worse, uh, that's going to be a multi-decade process. Uh, and so we believe that the combination of a resurgence in energy demand uh, and the impact of the massive reduction in, in energy investment could set up some cyclical rallies. The area from a dividend perspective, from our perspective, where we've been most interested is actually in pipeline corporations. Uh, we own a couple of those. And the interesting thing about that is that um, they have proved, uh, from a fundamental perspective, pretty defensive this year, where the earnings have come in. Many of the companies, the top companies there, have actually hit their initial guidance for the year, which they delivered before the pandemic ever happened. Um, and they're not exposed to commodity price, and yet they've sold off in many cases, uh, not quite as much as the producers, but, but meaningfully. So, so we do think that, that, that that's a piece. And then the last piece I throw in about energy that makes it unique is just that, um, I would, you know, generalist investors are not interested in energy. Uh, it's become so small in the S&P 500 that you can in some ways almost ignore it. Um, it's two or 3% of the port, you know, of the S&P. It's half the size of either Microsoft or Apple. Um, and, and, and as a sector, it's, it's become tiny. And while ultimately, hopefully it does go away, that will be a multi-decade process. And there will be some pretty big uh, and violent and volatile, you know, up moves and down moves along the way. So we think the fact that people are ignoring it to the degree they have also, you know, ultimately may sow the seeds of, of uh, people having to chase it to get in. Margaret, I see you nodding your head a little bit there. I, I thought it, I thought it was funny because um, because in some ways the when when no one's paying attention, that's when the inefficiencies are. And in the Russell 1000 growth, energy is less than one percent. So Mike is <laughs> Mike is right. I'm, I'm ignoring it right now. <laughs> um, we're more focused on things like retail. Um, so you know, we've been thinking about it that instead of looking for the V recovery or instead of looking for the U recovery, look for look for the square root recovery. Where, where on the other side, you're actually coming out better. You're a better positioned business. And so, you know, within retail, I think the, um, the, the story is that because, because things have been so bad um, with traditional retailers and especially mall-based retailers, you're going to have something like 2,000 stores close between 2020 and 2021. That's an enormous part of our, our retail store base. Um, and so the companies that have the balance sheets to survive that are not in the mall, that have either an online presence or an omni-channel presence, they're positioned to be the square root. <laughs> they're positioned to gain share um, coming out of it. And so we've been looking for businesses like that where, yes, we'll get the cyclical recovery, but hopefully we'll get something more. We'll get some market share growth and, and some, some real appreciation potential um, from there. I mean, we on the international side, we, we try to pair our, our typical investment approach with this kind of cyclical upswing. So it's still these companies which we want to look for. Do they have the long-term growth? Do they trade at the discount to the intrinsic value? And does the company have a strong mode and will they deliver the long-term free cash flows? So, and we talked about travel. The travel for sure will normalize because I want to get out of my house and uh, want to do something different. And that most likely will happen towards end of 21. But we prefer to invest in companies which are not only beaten up, but have the long-term growth engine there. And company one to mention would be like Amadeus, which is a booking engine for, for airline tickets. They're already the world market leader. And what happened in this pandemic is they actually got even stronger because the competitors on a relative scale got weaker because the balance sheets are not that strong. So we would expect a company like that to do fairly well and we have still the long-term growth engine behind us because at the end of the day, the um, overall growth in passengers is still, of course, 2020 being the exception, is still growing five to 6% on the long-term. And in a similar uh, order, when, when we talk about travel, you know, there is an airline manufacturer or frame manufacturer, which is called Airbus, which is in the duopoly with Boeing, of course, and they have the short-term headwind, but once the deliveries are starting up again, and most likely 22, and airline travel is coming back, that could be also a good high free cash flow uh, returning uh, company. So, and then there are of course indirect ways to play. We played more the luxury. We don't have that much of restaurants and uh, 
and theme parks in the international arena. It's more the luxury sector which is interesting, which is winning out of uh, out of increased travel. And the other one where I would spend a little bit more time on is on the business service sector, because as I said before, manufacturing has done already fairly well. Now the question is what is lacking most, and I see that in the business service sector, which is the last one to recover. So that could be another little search ground which will do well and fit in our investment approach. Discussing today, Mike, from a dividend perspective, is this enough to attract investors back to dividend stocks, or are you looking for other catalysts? Yeah, so um, we, we absolutely believe that dividends are very attractive right now, and that investors should be uh, should be focused on them. I think um, you know high growth dividend companies have done very well this year. So many of the names we own in our portfolio, companies like Microsoft, like Apple, like Mastercard, like Visa. Uh, you know, have done terrifically well. And um, you know, throughout this, some of the more value-oriented companies, uh, and even ones that aren't cyclical, have done have lagged a bit. Again, this is part of a sort of theme that we've seen this year where growth has done very well and other things not so much. And we do think there's a tremendous opportunity right now. Uh, and high-quality dividend payers that we own, you can get a, you know, 25 to 4% yield from a company that's very robust and with a, you know, solid growth outlook. Um, and we think that, um, you know, I think investors have been um, so whipsawed this year. Uh, the year started out one way, then you had COVID and everybody, you know, uh, ran for the bunkers and then everybody wanted to get back in and catch the rally uh, and sort of is the, re- the reopening trade. And I think, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people maybe aren't having the normal conversations they would have with their with their financial advisor, like, well, this is where I want to be in five years and how we're going to get there and how much should I be allocated to dividend paying stocks and bonds? It's much more been like, get me out, get me back in. Uh, and so I think um, I, I think if people sit down and have those conversations and reappraise uh, their portfolios for the years ahead. I think to the extent they're underrepresented there, we absolutely expect them to get back. Uh, it's a terrific time. Finally, as we wrap up this panel discussion, Margaret, what's your outlook for volatility and what risks are you paying the most attention to heading into the new year? Well, in in terms of of risks and things we've been thinking, I guess just to get back to something we said at the outset, which is, you know, what what does a divided Congress uh, mean for the markets? If there's one thing we know, it's that the markets do not like uncertainty. So the good news is that um, a divided Congress probably means less change, less uncertainty, and that should be less of a risk going forward. Um, You know, the thing that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is inflation, exactly what what, what Mike was talking about before. Um, The inflation and the slope of the yield curve is really one of the key determinants in in my view in terms of whether growth really outperforms in 2021. So we've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, we we know that historically uh, GDP growth and and inflation tend to be correlated since 1985. That's clearly been the case. We know we've had a a lot of stimulus in the US. We know that GDP growth is accelerating. Um, And so one would think that inflation would be starting to pick up. We're not really seeing it yet, but, um, but when inflation picks up and the yield curve steepens, that's, that's gonna um, cause that broadening out of the market. It's gonna be more cyclical. Um, we're gonna see less of a premium um, on the, the very narrow universe of growth stocks that have really performed so well for the last couple of years. So that's, that's kind of the key risk and opportunity that, that we see for 2021. So perhaps on the international side, um, um, of course, besides all of the vaccines, which we have gone through in all details by now, Um, It's a tightening of monetary conditions, which I personally, as you, as we have talked about, is is less likely. But also, more specific on on Europe, uh, we have a European budget, uh, which needs approval. And that is for the next five years. And in part of this budget is a 750 billion package, which has to be released for Corona purposes. And uh, that's currently held up uh, by countries like Poland and Hungary. Um, but both of them are net beneficiary and both of them are actually hit by the pandemic. And uh, I, I hope that rational thinking will prevail and these uh, funds will be released. And the second part is, uh, there's also more Europe specific, as you will not believe it. I mean, we're still talking about Brexit. and This is now how many years in the make? I think, what is it, for close to four by now? Um, and uh, that would be negative for the UK, but and, and to a lesser extent to Europe. But we will get uh, more details on that relatively soon. And uh, I, I, I could see that there will be kind of 
mild compromise. So that's, I think, uh, which is more, more region specific as a kind of risk. Mike, final word over to you. What about risks and volatility in the new year? Yeah, I, I think I think it um, it seems likely that volatility will will persist and and even be the volatility itself may be more volatile than it has been in the past. Uh, I think you know um, uh, 2020 has been such a remarkable year in so many ways, uh, and I think for for many investors and, and certainly for us, it's been very humbling. <laughs> Uh, so when you ask us, uh, when you ask me, you know, last year, if you asked me what I might have thought would be the risks uh, going into 2020, I'd say, oh, the election growth and, you know, inflation rates, uh, you know, pandemic was was not on my mind. So I, I think I'm more, we're all more aware than ever uh, that there are things we can't forecast that may, may be relevant. Um, I think on the very positive side, the vaccine is so much better uh, or is as, as good as could be hoped for that it really does provide um, real certainty that, that this is going to end and, and decisively, whether that's, you know, on the earlier side in March, April, May, or on the longer side, you know, towards the back half of next year, it's going to end. Our discounting mechanisms, they look forward. And so um, the markets have the confidence they need to start to project forward. That's very positive. Of the things that I'm aware of, about, you know, the, the, the normal stuff we talk about, the politics, the, the geopolitical, those are all obviously highly relevant. The one that has the most potential for, in our view, and I'm really a broken record here, to actually upset the apple cart and really change the dynamic on the markets would be if interest rates ever changed. That's been the million dollar question for the last 10 years and it hasn't happened yet. And, and all current points, you know, would seem to indicate it's not happening in the near term. But to the extent that there is, a, you know, that, that's a, that would be a spoiler for the markets or a real um, change for the markets that would, would result in all sorts of changes. And that's sort of the biggest thing that we're watching. But, but again, nothing near term points to that. Well, here's to hoping that 2021 is a little bit less remarkable or unprecedented for the sake of the world. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us and great to have you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, great to be here. Really enjoyed it, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. And thank you for watching this ClearBridge Investments exclusive 2021 Outlook Masterclass. I was joined by portfolio managers, Margaret Vitrano, Mike Klarfeld, and Michael Testorf. And I'm Jenna Dagenhart with Asset TV. Please note the following. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The opinions and views expressed in today's video are of the individual speakers as of December 1st, 2020, and may differ from other managers or the firm as a whole and are not intended to be a forecast of future events, a guarantee of future results, or investment advice. Any statistics referenced have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but the accuracy and completeness of this information cannot be guaranteed. Neither ClearBridge Investments nor its information providers are responsible for any damages or losses arising from any use of this information.